Welcome to Leader's Path, leadership journeys of people within the IT and business change professions. Brought to you by Middleton's Assured Talent, IT leadership and business change recruitment specialists. Good morning everyone, um, it's Nick Middleton here and recording an interlude uh, episode of Leader's Path. Um, a couple of episodes ago I said um, I asked for people to put some questions over um, and I would answer them by video. Um, I've had a, f- a few come through and I've added a couple others on that were asked in recent meetings that I thought it would be worth um, sharing on this format. So the, the, the first and most sensible one to start with, um, recently someone asked me why am I doing um, uh, the Leader's Path blog um, and the, uh, the video interviews um, with IT and business change leaders um, and there's, there's a range of reasons. Um, I think more and more of you out there will understand the concept of content marketing, um, that is putting uh, uh, content out there that is valuable to the people that you work with or want to work with or, or within the community that you do business. Um, you know, and for me as a IT and business change recruitment consultant, um, you know, it makes absolute sense to share information with that that leadership community within those sectors, and particularly because I've also got a, a, a deeper specialism within the kind of medium to, to senior level roles as well. Um, so yeah, so there's that. Um, it's interesting. I enjoy speaking to people anyway it's part of my day-to-day job interviewing people and asking them really detailed questions about their um, uh, their career history um, how they've, they've achieved what they've achieved and uh, you know and, and, and the magic tricks along the way it's just interesting and I hope other people find um, the, the, the videos and the blogs interesting as well um, and, and you know it, it feels good if someone does benefit from that and I think the same with the um, the people that are agreeing to be interviewed on these, I think they take some satisfaction that someone else might watch it and uh, feel it's, um, it's, it's helped them. So yeah, I, I think there is definitely a business element to it, um, you know, content marketing is helping business, but, but as I say, I think there's an interest and there's a, an enjoyment factor as well. Um, so someone threw back a question to me that I ask in the interviews um, and it's uh, ultimately what makes best talent and, and you know I usually ask it in the sense of you know how do you identify best talent um, for a particular role. Um, uh, I, I guess this is an interesting one. I think that there's you know, I, I don't think there's just talented people and untalented people for a start. I think often the, the, the you know we should be asking, well, how do we find the best suited person for our company and for our job um, and then create the right environment for them to, to flourish? And I think those are the more important factors than necessarily raw talent that someone's born with. Um, I, I don't doubt that there's people that are, you know, are, are more bound for a successful career. Um, they're maybe more driven. There's maybe some factors that will, will make them more successful but I think everyone has talent and it's about making the most of that talent and as a recruiter it's about how do we identify first of all you know, what is it, what are the skills and strengths that you need as a client and, and you know are we being realistic in those um, strengths and expecting that we, we can find them um, you know undoubtedly uh, I've had many situations where we're, we're looking at a kind of lower end role and you know Client may be expecting the the, the, the the sort of um the maturity and capability that would only come after you know more years experience um but I think you know understanding what it is that that you know will make someone succeed and and then find the way of how you will identify that in a recruitment process is is as important um. If if someone really wants to push me and say what do I think you know can make someone talented. I, you know, again, I think these factors help, such as um, uh, you know, keenness to learn. Um, uh, uh, certainly, a, a, a kind of uh, keenness to to question and do better in terms of questioning yourself. I think um, quite often the most successful people I've met are quite self doubting, um, which drives them to be better. I think that's quite a common trait in in. Um, a lot of successful people. Um, communication skills, it helps without a doubt. You know, I think 
you know, unfortunately, some people who are not natural communicators but are very capable, and they some of those people can equally thrive. Um, but but it undoubtedly helps if you can communicate. Um, uh, and and a bit of humility as well, I think, in your communication. I think confidence is is good to a certain extent, but I think maybe it's a British thing. But I, again, very successful people I know also demonstrate um, some humility in that as well. Um, but yeah, so there's a, there's there's undoubtedly a few things that you see as characteristics, um, you know, uh, listening, consideration of others, um, uh, you know, and a positivity, you know, thinking, um, you know, thinking that the best is possible, and and you know things, you know, that there is a, a positive opportunity out there. But again, that said, um, sometimes some pessimism. Pes Pessimism is uh, is is valuable in certain roles as well. People that 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 need to think of the worst case scenarios and and you know. So again, there's no there's no one magic answer to that. Um, and I think what I've seen in the the leaders past interviews so far that there's been a various you know, responses to that question. Um, but but communication has probably been the most constant within that. Um, uh, you know that the, the communication strength definitely helps people to be identified as talented and potentially be successful in roles. Um, what else? Uh, so this one was from um, someone looking for a job. Um, sounds like they were frustrated at uh, the you know the way recruitment works, and the question is why are recruiters not calling me back? Um, it's. Uh, uh, I, I know, you know, that there is a there is frustration as recruiters. Um, there can be the feeling that that particularly from a candidate perspective, there's l there's little consideration for them in the process, um, and and maybe um, uh, in my recruiter brethren that there's too much focus on the money that can be generated by making a placement um, or or doing a deal, as is often the terminology, and, and that can often leave um, uh, the candidate feeling unloved, um, and and really that it's not about them. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I I certainly spend a lot of time trying to give my candidates the best possible experience, but I think part of that is actually setting the right expectations. Um, and sometimes that might be, you know, you might not hear back from me because you you know you have a particular set of skills and experience um, that looks great, valuable, etc. But um, you know, it's for me to call you back. It's reliant on me having a particular requirement that's going to fit your particular group of um, skills, attributes, strengths, whatever. And if that doesn't come along, you won't hear from me. Um, you know, and, and I think setting that expectation undoubtedly makes a big difference. Um, you know, why aren't recruiters calling this person back? Well, there's, there's probably a range of reasons that, um, uh, you know, that, that could include, you know, they've just not got the right role. But then I would also look at things like, um, you know, is is all my communication to that recruiter um, uh, as good as it possibly could be? And, and by that, I meaning, you know, um, is the CV looking good? You know, and, and there's CV writing is very subjective as well. There's no one particular right answer. Um, but, but does it present me in the best possible way? And sometimes that's about formatting and the actual, you know, aesthetic of the CV as much as it is about the information. Um, is my email communication when I'm delivering that CV or, or any other communication, is that written in the best possible way? Am I speaking um, uh, in the right tone? Am I speak, you know, am I grammatically writing things correctly? You know, these things can make a difference to, you know, anyone, whether it's the recruiter or the end client who's doing, the, you know, who's going to hire, any communication is being analysed in a way of what, what will this be like if this person's working for me? So just to be conscious of all those things. And, and the same with verbal communication, you know, are you, um, I, I find sometimes that sometimes people come on the phone expecting, as a candidate, they may be expecting to not be treated fairly by the recruiter and that makes the conversation difficult because they're presuming I'm going to um, uh, uh, f fall into the, the, the kind of um, the camp of lots of others that they will um, be be unfairly treated by me or, or, or with little consideration, which certainly wouldn't be the case for me. But um, again, I think there is, I understand why people have come to that emotion. 
Um, but, but just being conscious of that and, and actually just trying to be positive, you probably will find that there's a more positive output. Um, the, the other thing is ensuring that, you know, if you are applying for jobs, they're relevant, you know, um, uh, that they, they, they are, you know, within the right sort of realm for you. Um, uh, there's, there's a whole load of stuff that I can talk about and perhaps save for another, um, uh, in fact I'm going to do that. Um, I'll have another video that I'll put up in the next um, uh, couple of weeks that w one of the things I'll run through with candidates what I call the portfolio of job seeking uh, activity and it's just the different things that you can do to go out and seek that right role for you um, and you know hints and tips etc and you know most of it's stuff that people know already um, but I think it would be valuable for me to just pull that all together in one video and I'll, I'll pick up on some of these points there but as I say to answer the question why are recruiters not calling me back just ensure that every form of communication and anything you're sharing just presents you in the best possible light because it does make a difference, particularly in a noisy market where there's, there's you know, there's there's enough candidates. Um, in in a in a quiet market or or in a market where you're in a very high demand skills, I'm sure you're not experiencing this problem. <laughs> so, um, uh, what else? Um, what should we do to increase the probability of our correct hire? Um, so it maybe goes back to this talent bit. Um, I, uh, I, I've created something called um, Assured Selection, which is a slightly different recruitment service where we are bringing in more at the upfront stage to really define the need. And I think that's the starting point where it often goes wrong, is the the hiring manager produces a list of skills um, experience and it's usually, I want someone who's done the same job in one of our competitors for X amount of years previously, um, and really doesn't take it anywhere beyond that. Um, what, what I think and why I developed this particular service was, you know, more there's, there's more we can do both as recruiters and as the hiring companies to ensure a, a, a better hire or increase the probability. And, and that initial definition stage is critical to that. So both understanding the real ins and outs of what the person needs to, to be able to do, um, the environment that they're going to be doing it within in the, their company, which is a key factor. Um, so often someone will say, I want a project manager who's delivered similar projects in one of our competitors, but who's to say the competitor the environment of the competitors is, is similar, that there may be a whole different set of challenges that that person will face in delivering that project, whether it's, you know, a greater level of bureaucracy, um, whether it's a more challenging stakeholder group, you know, there's a whole range of things that could change from one organisation to the other, and therefore require a different set of attributes and skills and strengths, so a completely different type of person. So for me, it's about identifying that so what are the what are the forces working against someone achieving their objectives so therefore what are the strengths they need um, and then identifying ways to actually identify those things in the individual and I think that's the other bit that's missed um, you know we, we've got to we've got to try and create in a more objective process recruitment still fairly subjective but you know it's something that's consistent that we can measure across a number of people to then evidence why one person is potentially better than the other. Um, there's always going to be a subjective element in it, but one of the things that I bring into the service is um, use of psychometrics, fairly commonplace now, um, but but I do it at my end as a recruiter. I'll bring them into the process of, um, again, through this assured selection model, um, just to try and bring in a greater level of evidence of why someone is more suitable than someone else. And, and really for me, it's not a, a screening tool because, again, I don't think psychometric assessments should or can be a screen, a complete screen out tool or a complete selection tool. Um, but it certainly helps create a greater picture of evidence of why someone is potentially right for the role. Um, then I work with the client to make sure that their process is, is um, uh, consistent across all candidates, which is the first key thing, um, consistent, consistent objective measuring across all candidates. Um, and, and you know what? Trying to take out that first um, impression decision-making that's often so, so part of you know, recruitment decisions, um, you know, someone walks in the room and they don't look quite right for what you envisage the person that you want to be. And often you're thinking about yourself and that, 
you know, we're looking to kind of create a mirror, mirror image of ourselves. We think we are right, so therefore someone who looks like us will be right and someone who doesn't look for us look like us won't. And I think those first impressions can often hamper a lot of people. Um, and, and it goes back to the point earlier about, you know, sometimes people aren't great in interviews and sometimes communication strengths isn't their, communication skills aren't their key strengths. And, and for some roles, that's fine, you know, but actually we forget then that the interviews for those roles where communication skills aren't their strengths or required, um, but, but that's part of the measurements of people that could potentially be fantastic. And I'm, I'm thinking a lot in the sort of technical recruitment that I did, I've done in the past where it really, you know, doesn't, it matters less than someone's aptitude for particular um, ways of thinking and um, uh, uh, types of kind of challenging of ideas and problems, um, you know, how well they may communicate. I'm not saying it's insignificant, but it matters less. And I think sometimes the interview process in its very standard form doesn't help them. And I think often those people are the ones that lose out to that first impression. Um, because so, so as I say, trying to create a process that, that takes those elements out, that makes it much more objective and it makes it consistent across a, a group of people you're interviewing is key to what I help clients put together. And, and you know, it goes maybe against the grain of many other recruiters. In, you know, in a balanced fashion, try and put enough stages in the interview that, that helps both parties make the right decision. Um, I think recruiters for years have been trying to say you need to recruit fast because you'll lose the candidate and you need to keep them engaged, etc. And, and I think there's there's elements of truth in that, but to the detriment of you as the potential employer having enough time with someone to really decide if they're right, and also for the potential employee having enough time with enough different people to decide is this the right role in the right company for me. So I think again there's a bit of a balance there and you know um, certainly two stages are required I think um, uh, and ideally I think a third stage that's you know in a different setting perhaps um, meeting multiple people um, but, but still making it clear that it is a stage I think there's also a challenge there that sometimes people take people out for social but it's still part of the interview process but it can be a bit awkward um, uh, if you decide and after that, that they're not right um, but yeah the right process um, and then the final thing um, that I do to increase probability of right hire is is putting a layer of support in after they started. Now, m most organisations have, you know, some onboarding process. I think most organisations would admit the the vary in in, in sort of um, uh, quality and and supportiveness. Um, I, I find that the more senior end of the market, there's, there seems to be much less because there's an expectation that we're paying £80,000 for a very experienced person. We should just be able to throw them in and off they go because that's what we're paying a lot of money for. So I think at that level there's a lot less, but I think any person entering a new organisation you know that's a that's a time of challenge and turmoil <laughs> will you feel your way through that organization will you understand in detail how to make things happen in that organization and and again some induction processes and you know will, will support that but others don't and what i've done as part of this assured selection model is um, I provide an uh, independent professional coach. It's a 90-day coaching session they receive from this end, you know, these individuals. Um, and, and it's purely designed to be a um, confidential support sort of process for that individual as they embed into the role. And therefore, hopefully, they will... They will Apologies, small well, computer error there. Um, yeah, so the um, so they get the ninety days coaching, helps them embed in the role, and really gets them to ask and probe challenges that might be more difficult to go to their line manager, who may be board level director, and say, "I'm a bit unsure about X, Y, Z." You know, again, you're 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 you know you're very cautious in those early days of making sure that the company feels they made the right hire and you may not want to ask those questions. You may struggle through to, to, to find the answers. So again, this is all about creating the, the, the right environment for 
or the right sort of circumstances for someone to flourish. So, uh, you know, that, that's what I believe increases the probability of making the right hire, and that's why I, I created that as a service. There's probably lots of other ways and things that you can do to increase the probability of hire. The, the scary thing is, and I think this is where, you know, um, you know, it's maybe not the factor that's often talked about, but actually the percentage probability of making a right hire and a right hire being identified by in a year's time would you hire the same person to the same role you know it's something like if it's just a general biographical interview you know less than 25 percent of the time people would answer that question with a yes you know as a, as a hire manager you know if you start adding in psychometrics and you know uh, making the process much more objective and improving the process um, you know, you're maybe getting towards 50%. Now, that's not to say that they're bad hires or wrong hires. It's just, you know, if we define a right hire as someone that you would definitely hire a year down the line into the same role, um, you know, so that's, that's quite interesting. And, and I, I do think that, you know, we, it is very challenging for anyone to create 100%. Well, you can't. You just can't. There's just too much subjective judgment in it, and there's just too many factors that influence uh, someone flourishing or not in a job. You know, because again, that 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 equation doesn't necessarily take into account all the other elements that follow from someone starting to make them more or less successful in their job. Third time lucky. Um, not sure why it keeps doing that. Anyway, um. Very very final question, um, and this was this was one that was asked in question in person. But I just thought it was an interesting question, um, or maybe interesting to hear me answer it. But uh, do I enjoy being a recruiter? Um, uh, I do. I've done it a long time now. Um, I think about fifteen or sixteen years. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't have its challenges. It certainly does. But whose job doesn't? You know, it, um, there's there's good times and there's harder times. Um, I've certainly had periods where I've been quite disillusioned by it, um, and I would say, you know, uh, you know, it's it's taken sort of thinking how I could maybe do my job differently, how um, uh, how I can do a better job um, to get me out of those periods because I think sometimes the frustration comes that you, you know. Um, you feel you're doing your best you possibly can, but the mechanism is not necessarily allowing you to, to 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 do the best possible job for your clients, and and over time that can be frustrating. Um, I think because we're in a competitive or, or often engaged in a competitive contingent manner, um, I think those sort of engagements often drive the wrong behaviours, and particularly if you're ever in competition with one of the more hard um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, cutthroat agencies who, you know, the guys that work there are just under more pressure to hit targets, um, you know, and, and that that creates certain behaviours which, which as, a, as, a, as a competitor working alongside can be detrimental to you, and it's, but it's out of your hands, it's frustrating. So there's those sort of elements that can disillusion or have disillusioned me over periods of time, but... I, you know, I love it. I love speaking to people every day. Um, I like the, the hunting of people. I like you know going out and trying to find the right person for for an organisation and engaging them and um, you know and uh, without sounding che cheesy, you know it feels really good when you get someone a good job. You know, and I think it's again really important to me the clients that I work with. I, I think I'm putting people into a good organisation where they'll you know they'll enjoy it. Um, so yeah, I, d I do really enjoy it. Um, you know, I, I run my own business now as a recruiter, and that, that has a lot of satisfaction. Um, there's bits I'm less good at. You know, uh, I've never been, you know, the, the great sort of cold collar of new business developer knocking down doors, but I'm sure that's probably good for a lot of people um, that they don't get frequent cold calls from me. But uh, yeah, I think. Uh, um, you know, I'm very happy in doing what I do, and uh, um, you know, hopefully that that shows shows out in um, the, the kind of experience people have when they work with me. Um, so, um, hopefully, you enjoyed this. Um, I will have probably in the next week or two another Leaders Path interview. Um, got a couple of people lined up, just getting the dates set up to do the actual interviews. Um, so we'll be sharing those. 
and then I will do a recording um, of my portfolio of job seeking activity advice again, just for hopefully for 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 everyone's benefit. Um, and and I'll probably continue doing these interludes every every you know month to two month. Um, you know, so again, if there's any questions uh, that you'd like to ask the recruiter, uh, please do so. Thank you very much. Cheers.